Welcome to analysis of game seven of this 12 game match in the 2018 Chess World Championships. And we now have Magnus with a double white at the middle stage of this competition. And he, and he really needs to start showing something with the white pieces. The white piece has really been an advantage. He struggled to get advantage when he played in the last World Championship match against Sergei Karyakin. And... Uh, well, so far, again, like I've mentioned, he hasn't shown anything. He started today with d4, not venturing into the Petrov, which we saw in yesterday's analysis. And Fabiano seems to be very well prepared in the Petrov, uh, which went e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6. So uh, I'm surprised Carlson hasn't worked more on this particular opening um, in, the, in the sort of build-up, because very easy to uh, gauge that Fabiano would be playing this. Instead, we have another Queen's Gambit, Queen's in Gambit, I'd say. So with d5, and now c4 being played, e6, knight c3, bishop e7. Uh, and uh, this Queen's Gambit, the most traditional way that black can really play against d4, and also one of the most solid ways that black can be played, we've seen a couple of times in the match already um, and Magnus well I would have thought had a bit of time to work out some new strategies in this position he sticks with the modern variation of going bishop to f4 something which I filmed a DVD on myself uh, along with Gary Kasparov I expect his DVD might even be a bit better than mine but hey ho um, the old line being bishop g5 and trying to direct pressure against d5 here. But bishop f4 is, the, like I said, a modern way that white plays. Uh, castling from black, e3, and now again we see this c5 move. And, you know, recently knight bd7, as I mentioned, ha had been sort of preferred, played by, by black in this position. With the idea after some move like queen c2, c5, if you take on c5 here, black has the opportunity to capture with the knight, and the knight has a very nice central square. c5 is sort of the old line, uh, but it is, again, getting a second wind, especially because of this match. And because of the likes of other players, mainly Hikaru Nakamura and Anand, who have made this, uh, again, a possibility. Now... The move here um, that is most commonly seen is d takes c5. There are some other options, but they really don't seem to be that worrying. And black doesn't really have time for knight bd7 now because of moves like b4, or even bishop d6 is probably okay for white here. So black has to take back with a bishop on c5, and now queen c2. Um, I'm, I was wondering as well, you know, Queen C2 is, is, of course, the main line. I mean, the other line, which I've known for as long as 10 years ago, is to take on D5 straight away. And, and I'm, I'm, I was thinking, you know, I was trying to work out what Carson might have prepared for this game. And I thought, well, maybe he'll give this one a go. Because Swidler in 2017 proved an advantage with White in this line against Harry Krishna. And I believe Hikaru Nakamura started to play this line with the white pieces as well. Hikaru being a, a bit of an expert on this variation. The main line now going knight takes d5. And we have a mass exchange here. When white tries to prove some kind of edge uh, against in the pawn structure. This isolated pawn on d5. If we get to an ending, could be a real target. And now some line with a3 stopping a check. Knight c6, bishop d3 has become... Uh, quite popular uh, recently and actually it seems like white can demonstrate some advantage in this line I mean in the long term like I say structurally speaking this is a problem that black has the pawn on d5 so I thought this might be a try at Carlson but instead he sticks with the again more traditional approach of queen c2 waiting for black to capture on c4 we've seen this before knight c6 and now a3 uh, stopping any knight b4s and again the main move 
queen a5. And here, yet again, uh, we have a bit of a junction. We saw rook d1, rook d8 being played um, in the second game. And I've, again, this was something that I thought might be possible with white considering uh, to play knight, e2, knight d2 here, which would have been improvement on game two. Other lines, I mean, I personally have had a lot of fun with castling queenside here, going for h7, as I mentioned in my previous analysis video. Uh, the new way that black can play this position, though, is with knight e4. And maybe this is something that Carlson had analysed and not found a good response to. This gives up a pawn temporarily, but then black comes with bishop takes a3, leading to quite a forced line where it seems black has at least a perpetual check at the moment. So this is this is the area that white needs to work on if he's going to get castle queenside to work. One move which I think is the most funniest move here, just to give you a feeling of everything that's been tried, b4 is not possible now because, of course, black can take this in multiple ways and, and the rook is in trouble. One very amusing move here, and a move which I'd love to have seen in the World Championships, would have been rook a2. And uh, this move um, has been tried on just a couple of occasions. And it does actually now threaten b4. And black can't stop this move. Bishop e7, b4 comes. And this is actually, again, a position where I would have thought white has some hope to fight for an advantage with uh, uh, the advantage of forcing black's pieces backwards. On the other hand, if we go back to this, again, clearly an important crossroads after Queen a5, Carlsen came prepared with Knight d2 now. And here we see a rare move played by Fabiano, and here he plays his Queen back to d8. And this steps out of any of the way of, of Knight b3 and b4. I mean, Queen d8 to me looks very sensible. One main move here, in actual fact, is is Bishop B4. This this is something which uh, one of the main main lines here. Again, we can look at top players. Hikaru played this against Tapalov, Paris, two thousand and seventeen, um, and I, I I I don't know. I mean, again, White is even struggling to prove much an advantage here. I mean, this whole variation seems to be okay for Black, and I find this quite weird that you know Team Carlson has tried this in a couple of times not showing anything and you know if you're just following the the standard sort of ways that have been played previously which haven't proven anything for white then surely you should be looking at another opening um and it was quite odd the way the game continued because queen d8 i mean it looks quite normal here um and now the game continued in in very normal fashion with knight b3 otherwise what's the point of knight d2 and here uh, bishop b6, the most active square for the bishop. This keeps ideas of black playing d4. And at this moment in time, I massively have my fingers crossed that Carson would step up and play um, the crazy and idea castling queenside here. I mean, again, castling queenside or putting a rook somehow on d1 must be the most thematic. You put a rook against this pawn, you pressurize the pawn, castle and queenside, the most aggressive, aggressive. I mean, I can't understand why Magnus didn't play this because you're playing into the preparation, I'd assume, of Fabiano. And we, we can have a load of fun here with something like bishop d7 and g4 and some crazy, crazy lines. Okay, maybe just at world championships level, this, this kind of stuff is hardly seen uh, nowadays. But, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen this slugfest on opposite sides of the board. That really would have uh, made this world championships come to life, uh, stepped up to another gear. Um, I mean, after bishop b6, the move really played in the game doesn't really, it can't really offer any opening advantage. Um, the simple bishop e2 it's just a little bit too slow this move to to try and gain anything um i mean take let's have a look at other options if magnus takes on d5 well um i don't think this can really offer much because obviously the white king is 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 not castled and because the bishop is well placed on b6 d4 is is going to open up the white king um Maybe another try would have been rook to d1 if you don't want to go for the g4 craziness. Um, rook to d1 and, you know, just trying to play in this manner. And this, this 
again seems to be a little bit more more uh, a little bit more sensible than bishop e2 bishop e2 though played and we now had queen e7 sensible move getting ready to play e5 getting off the d file and here bishop g5 and this pressurizes d5 now black takes on c4 and we have again as we see multiple times in this match a symmetrical pawn structure meaning it takes a lot of the dynamism so that bit funny out, out of the out of the position rather than taking on c4 straight away magnus played knight to d2 because clearly it looks like the knight is better on this square and now knight to e5 played stopping a knight coming here at least black can take off that strong knights and again we have another sort of a rather key moment in in the match in the game magnus castle kingside and i think after this he'd pretty much given up on any real uh, advantage at all um again playing slow moves like this in a position which is still quite tense you're going to allow your opponent to get his pieces developed to to get to get a satisfactory position the one thing that magnus does have here which is quite useful is this pin on the knight on f6 and I think his his last chance um, to try and get a good position would be to try to use this pin. I should also note that knight takes c4, as well as black being able to get rid of this uh, this piece. There's a nasty little move here, and that is queen c5. And queen c5 attacks both of the bishops, winning a bishop, gaining the bishop pair, giving black a very nice advantage. So you can't do this straight away. Um, but the move I was expecting here, and I think, you know, again, I, I think this match is, is lacking a little bit of the dynamism and the dynamic decisions that I, I would have hoped for um, would have been knight ce4. Why do we move this knight here? Uh, well, the other knight might want to take here and we give the queen the square on c3. And, and this would have kept things actually quite unbalanced and um, I think this is the decision which Magnus might come to regret especially if the match goes as against, goes against him he's not really showing anything in in calm waters he needs to step up a little bit and here um, he did actually say this is his main chance to play dynamically so of course he saw it uh, and now something like bishop d7 there's no way you, you can get take the pressure off this this is risky because white may not win this pawn back unless he takes it now of course um i i mean you can take it now but you walk into a pin but now something like queen c3 was very very intriguing and here well it looks intriguing but we're actually going to probably get black taken on e4 otherwise he's going to get in a lot of trouble here with these problems on the dark squares and after knight takes e4 a bit of a forced line knight takes e4 the queen can't move because you lose a piece so f6 is forced and now queen takes e5 is is a, a tactical point which i'm sure both players would have seen now something along the lines of um pawn takes g5 uh, you can't take the queen because well you lose that one bishop takes c4 and some position like this now where where um magnus has a much better pawn structure his pieces are quite good but black has the bishops and um the white king just at the moment slight, slightly slightly uh, in trouble but again if you want to win games of chess you have to take risks and this is a unsymmetrical pawn structure and this is the kind of thing i, I would have expected the champ magnus carlson to to prefer this kind of structure to what he gets in the game he's not getting any advantage from the 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 symmetrical structures and here the position is you know you're playing with white you need to try to do something with white this is the kind of position i'm sure it looks it looks i i think a better way for white to play after castle's kingside in the game well black simply develops bishop d7 and now bishop f4 white decides he needs to win this pawn and things again they they sort of blow over uh knight g6 in an open position and i say an open position because the d files are now open and if you simply look at black's bishops black bishops are going to be on open lines you don't want to lose your bishops so magnus now decides okay i i can't move i can't lose this bishop this bishop is very good so he saves it uh bishop c6 and this is a good move because it guards the c7 square and after knight takes c4 
Black can now start liquidating some of Magnus's good pieces. This bishop is a strong piece. Let's get rid of it. And it struck me around here that with the next move we see from White, White gives up all hope of any advantage. He he takes on d8, and this simply exchanges off all, all, all rooks. And such an idea in a position where there's no real pawn weaknesses can't, can't offer anything. Um, and we had more simple moves come in. Another pair of knights get exchanged. Black now takes on g3. Uh, I find that a little bit surprising because this is one case where the double pawns could actually... This structure is actually better than having a pawn on h2 in a lot of cases. Uh, they're a very solid structure for white. But again, there's not really enough left here uh, for either side to, to play, uh, play on. Uh, b6... The point is, if this bishop ever takes now, um, well, you can do this, but if you follow up with knight e5, there's an immediate perpetual this way uh, with the queen coming backwards and forwards. So Magnus decides, okay, he, he doesn't want to give away the draw that quickly. Uh, bishop b7, stepping out of the way of those ideas. And now, now he goes to try to unbalance it a little bit. Um, maybe he could have tried again something with g4 and even f4 here if he really had to win you know that would have been a quite ambition ambitious way to play i mean I, I don't necessarily i think it's quite risky because you know the pawns coming forwards you weaken the g4 square but uh, it's it's certainly an ambitious way that magnus could have played i think if he needed to win he'd have to go for something like this in the game bishop take g6 and e4 it can just not i mean black hasn't got any weaknesses black can't be worse and now queen c7 is good because we're going to swap queens off and do a little bit of damage to white structure after the eventual forcing of the knight to move. And this ending here doesn't really offer anything for either side. I mean, when I first glanced at this, I actually thought I quite like white if white could get the king to d4 because this knight is very good. The knight controls these squares, stopping a bishop coming there. The knight pressurizes f7. The knight maybe comes to c8. But then the more I looked at this, I thought this is unrealistic hope because this pawn on g2 is actually now, I said the pawn structure is generally better, but this is one case where the pawns aren't better. If this pawn was on h4, then I think, again, the pawn structure dictates you can play for a win or not. Why, why, why could white play for a win if this pawn on g2 was on h4? Well, because then white could put all his pawns on dark squares meaning that every single white pawn can't be attacked by the, the black bishop. And, for example, bishop f1 is in the game, is not playable. Your king could then come in towards the middle, and you may even be able to get a pawn break on the king side. So it actually makes a massive difference here, the, the structure. Uh, so maybe Fabiano's decision to actually take on g3 is now justified. Um, we had f6, f4. Both kings now slowly move towards the center. And after king e3, they um, now went for a drawing line with bishop f1, king f2, and they repeated as 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 such like this. Um, could black have played for a win in the in the position? The only, I mean, actually, maybe black is sort of justified to try because if the black king can get into either of these two squares, black black has a realistic chance to be better because you know these pawns, the a3 pawn, c3 pawn, could be very weak. If they're taken, Black gets the passport, and the e5 pawn is weak. But if he ever tries this with something like king c6, going for king d5, c4, king c5, king d3, and it, it now becomes clear that, that Black is you know can't make um, much progress here. He'd probably have to play b5, and now there is a knight e4 check, and after king c6, um, again, the simplest way here would be to take on b5 and go king d4. Um, and, okay, even if black now wins the g2 pawn, his extra pawn is completely loose, useless. The white king has got very good. And you could start to do annoying things with your own king. Your own king coming into c5 here. And this, this is certainly uh, a madness like position. There's no way white could lose here. I, I, I wouldn't have thought... Um, I suppose the knight is a little bit trapped, but with such an active king, it doesn't matter. And the knight actually can, well, can come back to d6. This is not a realistic way to win. So really, um, you know, that's how they drew in this game. Again, um, 
I'm still a bit perplexed by both sides' preparation. I mean, Team Magnus has had a bit of time to try and find something uh, in the opening, and, it, and this Knight D2 move was their attempted novelty, with Fabiano being prepared for this with Queen D8 immediately. Uh, quite a rare move, and this seems to be the way that Fabiano is going about his preparation. Maybe this is just proving to be very clever. Rather than going for the main, main lines, the Fabiano team is looking for, trying to find sort of very rare lines, which must, on the computer, give black uh, perfectly playable positions. I mean, I still think here some of the lines I demonstrated, especially that unbalanced position with a knight coming to e4, would have given white some chances for an edge. But at the moment, Fabiano's preparation to me, it, it, it seems to be on. It seems to be better than Magnus's. Magnus is just trying to get playable positions, but this is not working against Fabiano. He, he's not getting really any 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 trouble, and Fabiano is 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 always seems to be you know this queen d8 in this game, this rook d8. He seems to be one step ahead. So, to me, the more the match is, this match is going on, um. I, I'm thinking they're going to be a decisive result coming up very shortly. And, uh, well, I, I actually I haven't looked at Game 8 for, for the first... But I've seen the opening of Game 8, which I'm going to do a report on very soon. And that's going to be very interesting. But it's really, really finely balanced. I think uh, both teams obviously have things to be happy about. But I slightly feel that Team Fabiano will be feeling uh, the more happy with the way this match has developed. And let's not forget, I mean, we're getting right to the end of the match. It's game eight tomorrow, nine. There's only five games left, four or five games coming up. And, you know, one win now could really, really decide the match in, in one side's favour. So very interesting. Enter this World Championships coming up. Please do like this video. Please do subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for listening for my game seven update. I'll try to get game out, game eight out tonight sometime as well when I get a chance to do that. And uh, again, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'll hopefully be seeing you soon with the game eight analysis. Bye for now.